Finish the song. All I want for Christmas is... Welcome to The Whole Truth, everyone, where I am taking you through the entire Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation without skipping anything, because I believe that God's Word truly has the answers for our lives if we will get into it and read it, and that's what we're doing every day here on The Whole Truth. So if you have a Bible, open it up to Exodus chapter 33 and find verse 12. We've been talking about getting right with God. And the reason we've been talking about getting right with God is because what happened in the chapters prior to this, that is where the Israelite people made a golden calf and they worshiped that calf and even said the golden calf is the God who brought them out of Egypt. And they did that even to, to put salt in the wound. They did that while Moses was at the top of the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments for them so that they could know how to live in the presence of this holy God who had delivered them, they were down at the base of the mountain bowing down to a golden calf and praising its name for delivering them out of Egypt. You can see the problem. Well, in the beginning of chapter 33, we saw that the people repented and they repented because God said, I won't wipe you out. I won't kill you. Moses had done a good job of interceding. He had prostrated himself out before the Lord for 40 days and prayed for the people that God would not destroy the people. God says, I won't destroy them, but I'm not going to go with them. You all go ahead to the promised land. Get up and leave Sinai. You go ahead and you go to the promised land, but I'm not going to go with you. I'll send my angel before you, but I'm not going to go with you. Well, Moses now, he's he's been going out by himself, getting by himself in, in his own camp, in his own tent. And now Moses has a new thing to pray to the Lord. Let's see what Moses has to say today to God who is saying, you all can go ahead to the promised land, but I'm not going to go with you. Check it out. It's Exodus chapter 30 three and find verse 12. Then Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. And yet you have said, I know you by name and you have also found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us and so we shall be separate your people and I from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. And so the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, please show me your glory. And then he said, I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me. And you shall stand on the rock, and so it shall be while my, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. I love this story. It starts out with Moses going to God and saying, you've told us that you're going to send this angel before us, but you've not shown me who that is. Now you need to understand what Moses is doing. Moses is not saying that He's ungrateful for what God is doing, or he's somehow complaining about what God is doing. He's he's making a point to say he himself, Moses, he knows God. And he says, you're going to send us with this person. You're going to send us with this angel. You're going to send us with this presence. But I don't know that presence. I don't know that angel. He says, you're saying, that's what he's saying in the beginning. He's saying, you say you're going to bring us up. You say that you're going to bring us out, but you've not shown me who's going to go with us. And God says to Moses, this is pretty interesting. I'm going to go with you. The the emphasis here is that God says to Moses, I'm going to go with you you. And so Moses flips that back around and says, I want to know if you're going to go with us. If you're not going to go with us, then 
please don't even don't even bring us up out of Sinai. Just let us stay right here at the base of this mountain. We'll just stay right here at Sinai. But why take us up and take us into the promised land if you're not going to go with us? Now, I want you to think of how awesome this this section really is because God had promised in the first part of chapter 33, God had promised, I will drive out. I'm going to send you in to the promised land. I'm going to have the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. They're going to be driven out. I'm going to give you the promised land just like I told you. The only thing is, I'm not going to be there. Now Moses is going to God and saying, God, we want you to be there. What good is it for us to go into the promised land if your presence isn't there. What good is it for us to go in and have all the the Canaanites driven out? What good is it for us to be in a land flowing with milk and honey if we don't have you? And friends, that is the truth about getting right with God. Getting right with God is not so that I can get the blessings that God wants to give me. It's not so that I can get the stuff that I think that I need in my life, which many times we're so wrong about anyways. It's not because I'm trying to get something from God, but we want to get right with God because we want to be close with God. How different is that from the way that we think? When we talk about heaven, there's been a lot of conversation in my life lately about heaven because my wife has passed away. And there's a great comfort in knowing that my wife professed Jesus Christ as her Savior. Her faith was in Him, not in her own works. And so my family right now has this rock that we get to say, my wife, Sarah, is in heaven. She is in eternal glory. But in all the conversations we have about heaven, we talk about mansions. We talk about streets of gold. We talk about uh, the tree of life, the river of life. I've had conversations with people. I've had conversations with my own children about maybe some of the saints that their mom got to talk with or got to meet. And, And how awesome right? I mean, heaven is going to be an amazing place. And by the way, it's a real place. I keep assuring my children that about their mom. Their mom is still a real person and there is a real place called heaven. Know that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. But I want you to think about this. How awesome is it? Not only that there's mansions and streets of gold and so on and so forth. How awesome is it that we are in the presence of God, the very presence of Him? Can you imagine that there are going to be driveways made of gold? In other words, I want you to think that a driveway in heaven is worth more than all of the gold in Fort Knox. How crazy is that? The streets are paved with it, But here's the crazy thing. That won't be anything in comparison to God. God gives us crowns when we, when we uh, go to heaven, when we are in eternity with him, the Bible says that he gives us these crowns. Well, it also says that, that we can see in the book of the Revelation that the saints are taking the crowns off of their heads and they're throwing them, they're casting them at his feet and saying, we are not worthy. Can you imagine that to be in the very presence of God, to have a piece of, of jewelry that is worth more than your home today, and it means nothing because you're in his presence. Yeah, I'm sure that the angel choruses are sweet. I am sure that they are amazing. But can you imagine when you almost tune it out as background music, that angels are singing chorus songs to the Lord, but your focus is so on him, his presence is so real that you can't even pay attention to that because you are so laser focused on the God who created this universe, the God who loved us so much that he sent his only son Jesus to die for us, the God who loves us so intimately even though we are so wretched. What good is the promised land without the promise keeper? What good is it to have all of eternity, even if we had all of eternity. But if God's presence wasn't there, just leave me here. Just leave me here on this old earth. Why should I Why should I want to be in glory if God is not there? This is the amazing thing about getting right with God. It's His presence and His presence He has offered. And so there's one more part that I want to deal with, which is this part where Moses says, hey, I want to see you. Show me your glory. 
And God says, I can't show you my face because if you see my face, you will die. Now, I want you to think about something. Remember that, first of all, in the last video, in the last section uh, in chapter 33, we heard that God talked with Moses face to face. And a lot of people make this big deal of that. Did Moses actually see God face to face? And then God saying, you can't see my face. Friends, Moses talking to God face to face is an expression of, to say this is how, this is like the way, just like a friend would talk with a friend face to face. Moses got to have those sorts of conversations with God. This was an intimate relationship that he had. And so now Moses is saying, I want more of that. This is the same Moses who, when he goes to the tent of meeting, God's presence comes down. Everybody can see it in this cloud. Moses has been there in the very presence of God, and yet he wants more. More. God says, I can't show you my face because if you see my face, you will die. But I tell you what I will do. I'll put you in this cleft of this rock. I'm going to cover you with my hand and then I'm going to pass by. And as I pass by, I'm going to take my hand away and you're going to get to see me as I walk by. I'm going to literally pass you by. What an experience. And I want you to get this. Think of how crazy this is. There's a potential. Moses is saying of this, I want to see your presence. I want to see. This is the same God that when he was on the mountain, the mountain was shaking and things were on fire and the people were so scared to death. The Israelite people were so scared. They said, we don't ever want to experience that again. Moses is getting so close with God that even if it meant his demise, he still wanted to see him. Now, listen, God obviously doesn't want Moses to die from seeing him. And that's why God protected him. We don't fully understand the holiness and the greatness of God, but God does know that. He understands it, and he understands our infirmities. He understands the things that we can't understand, and God wanted what was best for Moses, and he's obviously demonstrating here that he still wants what's best for the Israelite people because God could have just taken Moses on home. He could have just taken Moses on into glory. I mean, he did that with other prophets, with another prophet later in the scriptures, remember, that he could have just reached down and taken Moses into glory, but he didn't. Why? Because God still needed Moses to lead the Israelite people to the promised land. And so God needed Moses to still be right here. So if we need to get right with God, what did we learn? We need to repent. We need to get alone with God. And now seek him only. Don't seek the benefits. Don't seek the blessings. Those things are natural outpourings of being in the presence of God. Being with him, being his child, he promises fruits of the Spirit. He promises gifts of the Spirit. And he does tell us that he will take care of us. He tells us that he loves us and, he, and, and that he's going to take care of our needs. But that should not be my focus. My focus should be, I just want him because he is the one who loved me when I was unlovable. That's the God who has created us. And so here's what I want to leave you with today, that your relationship with God and seeking his presence is not just this future uh, when I get to heaven moment, but right now in the very life you live, you can seek to be in the presence of God for no other reason than to see him, to experience him. And that's where our focus ought to be. All right, I hope that you enjoyed today's video, and I hope that I'll see you tomorrow as we get into Exodus chapter 34. I'll see you then. <laughs>